Good evening, ladies and gentlemen from uh, Miami. This is John Quelch, the uh, Dean of the University of Miami, Patty and Alan Herbert Business School. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, this evening, uh, Mark Ganzi, uh, the CEO of uh, Digital Bridge. Um, and Mark is actually kindly joining us from uh, Paris, uh, which is six hours ahead, but uh, uh, he's uh, in Europe on business and uh, has squeezed us into a very, very difficult and punishing schedule. Mark, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks, John. It's a real, real, real privilege to be here and uh, spend time with you and um, rather other members of the faculty and students, most importantly. Thank you. Uh, and we also have uh, joining me this evening, Neam Yaragi, who is an assistant professor in our business technology department. Uh, we at the business school are investing uh, significantly in expanding our business technology department. And uh, Neam uh, recently joined us. He's also uh, a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, Neam, welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. All right. So let's get underway. Mark, um, Digital Bridge, uh, what is it and uh, what does it do? Well, first and foremost, we're a publicly traded real estate investment trust, John, which um, probably really doesn't do the uh, the complete explanation justice. We invest, own, and operate digital infrastructure or digital real estate uh, on a global basis. Um, today, we own and operate about 43 plus billion of assets on a global basis between Asia, Europe, um, Latin America, the United States, and Canada, and most recently, uh, an $800 million commitment to build the largest data center campus in Africa. So now actually operating in, in all five continents uh, for the first time, but Really, we're a global business that's focused on serving customers, and we serve customers by building that mission-critical infrastructure that helps enable the digital economy. Um, among the various business uh, divisions or aspects of the uh, digital bridge operation, uh, wh which are growing fastest? Uh, wh where are you placing your bets? Well, I think what's interesting is you really uh, we're in sort of an enviable space. You don't have to pick. Right. All of the verticals that we're investing in are growing incredibly fast. So, you know, we have five um, really important investable themes right now that translate specifically into dollars spent into infrastructure. So the first thematic that we think is most topical for today's discussion is just, you know, cloud migration. Um, the movement to the cloud is, is probably uh, is a multi-decade movement for enterprises and for institutions and for consumers, um, and we'll be doing that for the next decade. Uh, about 1.3 trillion, that's trillion dollars of CapEx, will be spent between now and, and 2028. So we've got six years to basically put out a cadence of roughly about $175 billion of CapEx per year, keeping up with Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, well, Meta, and, and other web scalers. Second theme is 5G networks. We've been uh, we, we've started about a year ago building 5G networks here in the US, in the United States. Uh, we're, we've already built 5G networks in the Nordics. We're building them in Europe. We're building them in Asia. We'll eventually build them in Latin America. But the migration path, John, from 4G to 5G is one of the most complicated builds that I've ever been involved in since starting to build network infrastructure when I started as an entrepreneur in 1994 in Philadelphia building my first, my first startup. I'd say the third most interesting thematic that we see is the movement of data uh, or data gravity to the edge. Uh, and we can talk, uh, Neam, a little bit more about this, but um, one thing COVID taught us is the infrastructure and how data was ultimately transmitted and how data ultimately fell to the consumer of the enterprise. COVID flipped that upside down. So traditionally, a lot of data was used in the CBD center, but COVID taught us that you had to have data and capabilities and storage and compute in secondary and tertiary markets and moving out into the suburbs. And that completely flipped, you know, flipped sort of the thesis on its side. And so edge computing was born. So we're, we're investing a lot in edge computing. The fourth thematic I really love talking about is um, IoT, uh, Internet of Things. And this is really the industrialization of wireless networks with the overlay of applications. And so the ability to take wireless networks and to transform the enterprise you know, create a faster experience. This is digital transformation at its core. And I know, Neam, you want to talk about this too, but we've got numerous enterprise case studies, whether it's Ford Motors, whether it's the Port of Long Beach, whether it's all the New York City airports, we're using digital technology to change workflows, to change processes, to change yield management. I mean, this is the core of what you teach at the university today, and it's happening. It's all happening right now. It's super exciting. 
The fifth uh, thing that I'd say is, is um, software defined networks. This will be the biggest paradigm shift in how we build networks going forward, not rely, relying on sort of a one-to-one -one linear uh, relationship with infrastructure and with the network, but really virtualization of the network and the enterprise and being able to dial up resources on a global basis. We're spending a lot of time on this. Um, uh, probably our hottest product right now in fiber um, is software-defined WAN, wide area networks. And this is what all um, CIOs and CTOs are doing at major enterprises today is they're they're creating a virtual layer uh, to their wide area network, which is, think about what the wide area network is today, John, it's the planet, right? It's, you can't think in a single dimension. So these are incredibly exciting thematics. And so they're all growing, right? And so they're all growing at like 25 to 35% CAGR. So I walk in every day and I tell our, I tell our team, I said, look, uh, we're pretty lucky, right? We walk into this app, apple orchard every morning. Some of you are picking up apples and selling them. Some of you are making apple juice, some are making apple pie, but we're in one of the most fertile apple, apple orchards in the world today. And so there's a lot of investable opportunity. And so we're raising capital. We're yeah. backing great management teams. We're building great companies through buy and build strategies. And we're working with some of the most exciting customers and logos in the world. It's really a, this isn't work. I mean, I, I feel really lucky. I get to come in every day and, and every day we get to write a new narrative. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, and so the, what, what's the biggest uh, challenge then? Would it be... Uh talent acquisition and retention, or is that uh, not a problem either? You know, that, that's been a big theme this year in Wall Street with a lot of my peers. Um, a lot of the cohorts that I went to business school with are now running some of the major private equity firms in Wall Street. And we talk occasionally and um, got great friendships at, at Blackstone and Starwood and, and Carlisle. And we all talk about it. Talent is really hard to retain and keep today. Um, bonuses are going to be up on Wall Street between 20 to 40 percent this year. Base wages are moving up eight to eleven percent in our industry, um, and you got to get creative. We don't really give away the the sort of keys to our cookbook, but um, we haven't lost a single person this year. Uh, literally in the eight years I've built this company, I've had two senior executives leave out of a uh, hundred ninety seven people. I do have a formula for how to retain people, and it it really gets down to giving everyone a chance to be an owner. I'm be big big believer in you know having multiple layers of the organization, John, own the company and own the own the carry and the funds. So everyone's invested, everyone's aligned uh, with the vision and the mission. I think, you know, uh, calling our headquarters here in South Florida and having interesting offices in places like London and Singapore, uh, in Paris and Los Angeles, you know, we move our employees around, we keep them fresh, we never keep them on one deal. We're constantly moving talent around and challenging them. Um, it's not an environment, you know, at the analyst and associate level, we, we do have some attrition where they move on and go to maybe a Wall Street firm or they go to investment banks, but our retention rates are industry leading and it's because we've been very creative. Um, and I also say South Florida has been really helpful. I've been building businesses in South Florida for 20 years. Um, I've had a real privilege of working with some great entrepreneurs that, that I called my partners and people really like working in Florida. It's a, it's a vibrant community. Um, it's a great gateway to Latin America and to Europe and, and other parts of the world. So we haven't seen the attrition that the other firms have seen, but we, we do have to get creative in terms of compensation and retaining. And, and most, most importantly, I've got to win um, my cohort's mind space. I got to keep people excited. And so we do work in a pretty exciting sector. So a lot of our folks are really engaged. We have very, very high engagement uh, amongst our people. And we were so busy in COVID, John. Um, and we had to get more creative, you know, so we did a lot more smaller, we're doing a lot more smaller offsites. So we'll go somewhere for three days in a COVID friendly environment. We'll do a lot of act tour, outdoor activities. We'll do a lot of um, breakout sessions and team building and pushing each other and pushing our boundaries physically. And, um, and I find that's good because in COVID, we've had to get creative on how we stay together and how we keep the team, you know, focused. So th this is not your uh, first rodeo. Uh, you, uh, uh, with the CEO of GTP. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, that experience, uh, how what you learned there fed into the, uh, the concept and thinking behind Digital Bridge? And then we'll hand over to Neam. Yeah, so I've, I've had the privilege of being um, CEO of, of uh, president or CEO of three startups, um, going back to Apex and then GTP and then Digital Bridge. And I'd say there's actually a lot of applied learnings across all of the things that we built in previous cycles. GTP was a great business because it had great people and we had great culture. Um, and we had a lot of respect on the team. And, and my philosophy as CEO is, is really to give people the power to make decisions. Um, people that have worked for me previously 
know that my belief is you got to give people the chance to make decisions. You got to hire the right people to make decisions um, and give them a chance to make those decisions. Um, mistakes are healthy. Uh, I want our employees to make mistakes because it means they're learning and they're pushing the envelope. I don't want you to make the same mistake twice. And the simple adage, you know, make the same mistake three times and you're probably, you're probably going to be cleaning out your desk. Um, but I think the applied learnings are about, you know, once again, having a lot of you know, deep ownership, giving people uh, equity in these businesses, you know, down at, at junior levels, um, keeping the team young and vibrant, um, giving people a chance to make decisions. Empowerment is really critical. Uh, and just hire great people. You know, that's, I, I've had the real privilege for 28 years of working with some of the best people. And um, some of them still work with me today. I literally have the same business partner I've had since 1994. That's not accidental. You know, when you have a lot of respect and you're having a lot of fun and you're working hard and you play hard, um, I think that's contagious. And, and hopefully that feeds the energy that I give to my team, they give to me back. And, you know, that energy feeds on the energy. I'm a big energy person and believe that, you know, you, you can create the energy uh, through culture. And we're, we're big on culture. We're big on being engaged in the community. Um, we've been, you know, giving back in this particular community uh, coming up on 20 years now. Uh, Alex, my partner, Alex, and I figured out through our charitable network, we've, we've given to, you know, probably somewhere in the order of magnitude, about $48 million to local charities, but most importantly, giving almost 300,000 hours of our time uh, where it's not just a vacant check. You've got to show up, you've got to be in the community, you've got to be engaged. And, and we're now applying that in Digital Bridge in new different ways around DEI and ESG. And there's some interesting things that we're doing to increase community engagement, but also create a career path and create um, access and create equality. That's really been a, a big mantra in our shop for the last two years is how do we get young people engaged and thinking about digital infrastructure? How do we create an apprenticeship path? How do we create opportunities for everyone for internships? And then ultimately, how do we take those great interns from diverse backgrounds and bring them into our shop? And so uh, that's been a, a lot of success for us. We've actually um, implemented a really cool program um, about three years ago where we work with historic black colleges and universities, five of them in particular, that they're getting equal footing in our summer internship program. We've created fellowships. Um, we've done a huge um, uh, contribution and our time and effort into impact data at Morehouse College. We're actually building a data center and we're creating a career curriculum for uh, young, young students at that university to have a future, to come out and, and be a computer engineer, which are some of the best jobs that are high paying. Why, why have people go to school where they're gonna come out and make $40,000 a year and can't pay uh, back their college loans? Let them come out as an engineer making $135,000 working at Dell or Microsoft. And you give people hope and you give them progression and you give them equality. And we've, digital can be the great leveler um, to equalize what's happening in the world today. Uh, the digital divide doesn't have to exist. Yeah. We can all sort of take the economy forward by, by bringing everyone along for that journey. So. That's what gets me excited. There's some stuff we're doing on ESG that I think, Niam, you're going to ask me about, which are going to be some tough questions, but let's let's get into it. <laughs> well, I, lo I love the idea of uh, the digital equalizer as opposed to the digital divide. That's so much more an optimistic way of looking at it. Uh, Niam, go ahead. Mark, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for all the information that you provided so far. You are a proven executive in uh, managing digital assets with a lifetime of laser-focused experience on digital infrastructure. Uh, President Biden's infrastructure bill includes $65 billion for broadband internet. Uh, what do you think would be the most significant outcome of that investment? Well, my, my hope is that um, I'm going to come back to training and vocation, Niam. Um, we did stuff um, a small part in that bill to provide for the NTIA to help create path for uh, training of veterans and also for the training of uh, minorities and diverse candidates in, in, in you know, what we would call sort of uh, urban challenged areas from a you know, net income household perspective. And so we didn't get enough. I mean, to be honest, I would have liked more. I sit on the board of the FCC and um, worked with uh, Mark Warner in helping draft some of the legislation in this bill. Um, the unfortunate part of this is about 45 billion, Niam, just goes straight to the states. So, you know, th that's a bit of an unfortunate uh, measure because a lot of what happens at states is, is, is sort of what I call glad handing, which is he who's giving the most money and those that are contributing 
the major telcos are going to end up getting and the cable companies are going to get most of that money. Why? Because they're controlling the state uh, legislation agenda and they're very powerful from a state lobbying effort. So we've right. got to make sure that that money Neum, does not go to existing providers with clean balance sheets that are just going to overbuild existing providers. We all don't need to go chase, you know, the neighborhoods with $2 million homes. That does not give you digital equalization, right? That continues to build the divide. So, you know, we, we've, we've got to really focus on E-rate. We've got to make sure that we're getting the money to high schools. We've got to make sure that we're getting broadband connectivity, you know, multi-paired fiber routes into schools, making sure that once it does get there, you've got the right optical light switching gear, you've got the right IT infrastructure, um, and that the school districts are getting access to the cloud. And then in turn, they can build their own software to find network so that technology works when kids go home with their tablets. It's no good if a kid goes home and he doesn't have internet. That doesn't work. That's not a good solution. So we've got to give devices that have, you know, 5G air cards. And, and this is the stuff that I've been preaching along with other members of, uh, of the board of the FCC. Um, Chairman Rosenwinkel, she's, she's great. Jessica's amazing. She's very focused on this issue. Uh, she shares my passion for um, what I would call inner city, you know, connectivity issues that we're dealing with. And um, we've just got to hold states accountable ultimately for where that 45 billion goes. Now, the good news is there is 20 billion sitting at the federal level. Um, I'd love to retrain our veterans. Um, those of you that you know have known me and, and, and people that have worked in the tower industry know I've been a champion for veterans, retraining them, getting them re-engaged in the economy. When you have an engaged veteran, they're the best employees. They're loyal, they're mission capable, they show up on time, they have discipline, they have respect, and um, they wanna get the mission done, which is great. And right now in this country, we've got a really huge mission to get done. So re-weaponizing our military to go fight the next battles, which are gonna be fought in the digital uh, ecosystem or could eventually be fought in the, uh, in the metaverse, by the way, by example, that's not uh, completely science fiction at this point, but we've gotta arm our economy for the next wave of, of digital terrorism. And we're wildly under-equipped and under-prepared. Following up on that, how would you compare the US digital infrastructure with its global counterparts? Well, I think we, we, we have some of the leading infrastructure um, in the world. So if you think about from a fiber perspective, we've got more fiber than any other country by a factor of 3x. So from a broadband communications perspective, we're one of the, one of the best built countries in terms of broadband infrastructure. Now we have gaps. Make no mistake about it. We have some gaps in connectivity in rural areas, uh, tertiary markets, and, and we've got to do a better job of, of bringing that connectivity to rural America. I've been an advocate for that as well. And uh, so that, that's a big part of what we've got to do. I think from a mobile coverage perspective, you know, in the United States, you know, absent the Nordics in Japan probably has the best mobile coverage in the, you know, in the world. Uh, the Nordics is spectacular. Finland, Sweden, and, and, and Norway have spectacular coverage, um, as does Japan. So we are a little bit of a lagger as it relates to Japan and, and the Nordics, but we're, we're generally a leader on a global scale. And then from a data center perspective, in terms of total power compute, um, the United States has 10x more global compute than any other country in the world, more than China by a massive factor. So wow. our cloud workloads and the total amount of power compute that sits in our data centers that are powering next generation applications and wide area networks is, is far greater than any other nation uh, out there. So we do lead from a hyperscale perspective and from an edge computing perspective. Um, the one area that, that some people do say is like, okay, so that's fine, but you know, where are we from a 5G migration path? And there, you know, we're building that network out. It got a lot of airtime, you know, probably as you saw Neymar last week about some of the challenges of the FAA and all of that was politics. You know, it was T-Mobile lobbying against AT&T and Verizon. It's a little turf war they have. It's mm -hmm. very exciting. But the reality is, you know, uh, the spectrum that's being used by AT&T and Verizon, which is C-band spectrum, that operates perfectly fine in 40 countries around the world and has been operating now for multiple years. So thousands of U.S. flights have been landing in those countries with no interference to altimeters. This was a red herring. Um, now there is one style of jet, an Ember Air jet, which does have some interference with the altimeters, but there hasn't been any you know, tragic failure of those altimeters. So this was a lot of politics and a lot of noise, and I think it'll, it'll eventually dissipate. So that slowed down a little bit of our 5G networks, but I, I think our 5G networks are going to be incredible when they're finally you know, optimized and lit up. And I think consumers will benefit from that, as will enterprises. Enterprises will really benefit from 5G infrastructure. Fabulous. And, you know, to change gears a little bit, uh, 
Can you give us an insider view on the importance of clean and renewable energy for data centers and basically uh, tell us how far the industry is from fully transitioning to clean energy? Well, look, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if the industry can commit to full deep carbonization by a date certain year. This is sort of the challenge. We have a, a sector that's lighting up, you know, um, close to 800 megawatts per year of power. So think about that. 800 megawatts of new power is uh, is coming on. You're looking at a gigawatt per year starting in two more years. So we're, we keep adding more carbon unfriendly power to these data centers. That's the bad news, right? Okay, here's the good news. The good news is, you know, we've made a commitment to get our entire data center portfolio uh, carbon neutral by 2030. It's an aggressive stance, but we're making a lot of progress. Um, we do own four data center businesses around the world. Our first one went fully green this year. We decarbonized a business in Latin America called Scala. And now we're using 100% hydro energy, uh, which is great. Totally renewable. Um, we've created our own renewable substations. We're totally off the core grid now, which is great. And we have backup storage and generators, which we need to get into a carbon neutral framework with fuel cells. So we're getting there. Uh, this experience that we had down in Brazil has shown us that we can get there. So our other businesses, um, our biggest data center business, Vantage, which has you know over 30 hyperscale campuses around the world. Um, today, they're about 58% carbon neutral. They've got a long ways to go. Uh, data Bank, our edge computing business, about 63% uh, with clean energy. And then our business Atlas Edge in Europe is at about 22% clean energy, but has a clear ramp to get to carbon neutral in about three years. So all of our CEOs down at our portfolio company levels are very focused on this issue. I'm focused on this issue. Um, we had two tower companies go carbon neutral this year. Our first fiber business went, went completely carbon neutral this year, Beanfield in Canada. So we're making strides. Um, it's hard work. Um, but I would tell you it's, it's, it's more expensive. It's going to cost us a little more money. But if we can save the planet and we can give our children a future, that's a low cost to pay for a very bright future. The key right, to that right. is really trying to qualify and quantify, Niam, the degradation in IRRs. And so when we're out talking to pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and insurance companies about giving us billions of dollars to invest, we say, look, we've made this commitment. It's very aggressive. Um, our counterparts are saying 2040 and 2035. I say that's too late. We can't wait 20 years to get this planet back in shape. So we've been very aggressive on this. Um, and we've also told investors, look, returns may suffer 100 to 150 basis points. Are you okay with that? Because we can continue to make the same mistakes we're making with the planet and make you 150 basis points more, or we can do something right. And instead of taking a net IRR of 17%, we're gonna take a net IRR of 15.7%. Are you okay with that? And investors around the globe have resoundingly said, we're okay with that. So we've gotta be prepared to take a bit of degradation from a capitalism perspective, but the environmentalist in me says, you know, this is the way we go many, many steps forward. Fabulous. And, you know, being in Miami, the capital of cryptocurrencies, uh, I can't resist the, uh, the urge to ask. Is uh, Miami the, the capital of cryptocurrency? Uh, I don't know. Iceland, Iceland, Iceland might have an argument with you. Iceland might have a really good argument with you. We'll get to that in a second, but let's, <laughs> let's keep going. So uh, uh, are you investing in any crypto miners? And uh, to what extent do you envision that crypto industry would be a significant user of your infrastructure? Well, it, it, it is today. Uh, crypto, crypto applications and crypto miners use our infrastructure today. Uh, they use our fiber, they use our data centers. Um, they have a voracious appetite for two things, mm -hmm. uh, connectivity and power, but mostly power. Um, we just recently entered into a contract to sell our two uh, crypto mines in Iceland. Uh, Iceland is really the, from a physical perspective, uh, Neom is sort of the crypto capital of the planet. Uh, powers all hydro, it's really cheap. Um, there's a lot of land, land is cheap. Uh, there's an educated workforce. And uh, with unlimited power, people are moving a lot of those, you know, non-CBD central workloads to places like Norway and Iceland. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, that's kind of been the, the, the migration path of, of crypto right now. We'll continue to build it. It's not ESG friendly. I'll just be very clear with you. Um, the amount of power that we're burning and consuming at these data centers is just insane. Uh, 
um, and it's not particularly good for the planet. So we're trying to create um, some new ideas um, of putting crypto mines actually in the center of the United States into some of the agricultural states, you know, upper Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, you know, we've got an abundance of um, wind and we've got an abundance of solar and where we can use renewable energy in places where we've got a lot of land and we can aggregate that wind and aggregate that solar. Um, so we're, we're looking at two different locations right now. One's gonna be adjacent to a nuclear power plant. The other is gonna be adjacent to the largest wind farm in the United States. And um, we're looking to invest with two utility companies in a JV where we build, you know, what we call carbon neutral day one crypto mines. That's, uh, that's great. And, you know, to get back to uh, your earlier comments about decentralization, we're now observing a, a decentralization of internet. The digital visionaries are promising a mass exodus uh, from web 2.0 to web 3.0. Uh, how do you think that the digital infrastructure would evolve as a result of this shift? So it's all about what we were talking about earlier for that, which is, um, is, is SDN. I mean, the virtualization of networks and, and moving from web.2 to web.3.0 is, is all about creating that software-defined ecosystem where you can dial up resources globally without having to be obstructed by a server and being obstructed by fiber. So when we talk about the software-defined layer of the network, it's ultimately a putting resources that we typically put in a local area network, NIM, and moving those into public cloud or private cloud. And once you get into public cloud and private cloud, you can proliferate that network globally on a millisecond, which is a complete change of how we've historically have built the web, how we've designed the web, security around the web. And so it, it's a complete rethink in terms of how we're designing uh, network architecture, network infrastructure, and network security. So this movement to the cloud that I talked about, it, it all comes back to that. That's, that's the number one investable thematic that we're working on today is not only just the physical infrastructure of migrating data to the cloud, migrating enterprises to the cloud, public safety to the cloud, mobile networks to the cloud, um, but also reimagining what you know, the networks of the future look like. And that's not gonna happen you know, by building a new fiber optic line. It's gonna happen by virtualizing that and building the right software that gives you the capabilities to have global reach on demand. Fabulous. Um, let, let, let me, if I may, just interject uh, for a moment, uh, Niamh. I just want to follow up and ask uh, Mark a little bit about cybersecurity matters. Um, do you address those? How do you address them? Well, look, we, we, we don't own the servers. Um, so we've always made it clear that we're not a technology company. We enable technology, we host technology, we transport technology, but at the end of the day, you know, where digital bridge stops is that physical infrastructure. So we provide the space, power, and cooling uh, for companies to host their applications and to host their servers. Um, but rarely do we get involved in the technology migration path. Now that's changing. I would tell you in a software defined environment, we've been rethinking our thesis, John, about where we play in the stack. Do we go further up the stack in terms of being a fully integrated provider? Of infrastructure and to do that, you're going to have to own your own software to find capabilities. So we're spending a lot of time on that. Cybersecurity is hard. Um, we've we've never seen um, you know more corporate raiders and corporate attacks than we've seen in 2022. Um, data thieves, data hostaging, as we call it, uh, is massively on the rise. Um, enterprises are fully consumed and rightfully so in protecting their data. But I think you got to start out with the assumption that no data is safe, right? So Whatever you're putting on your, you know, your, uh, you know, your iDrive, or whether you're putting it on, you know, U of M's public cloud or private cloud, um, protect your data. If it's important to you, localize your data. Um, but data is not entirely safe and secure, and people just have to understand the world we live in today. Um, that that's part of the risk and that's part of the game. Now, can we get better at it? Of course, we can get better at it. Can we harden our facilities better? Yes, of course. But cyber terrorism once again happens at a software-defined level. You know, cyber terrorists don't like walk up to a data center and cut the fiber. They could, by the way, it would not be that hard. I mean, it is hard, you gotta know where the fiber is, but you know, ultimately the data center itself is pretty hardened. Um, three layers of security, sometimes four layers of security to walk from the curb to the actual data hall where a server is. And most of our data halls now are retinal scans. So people gotta walk up, they gotta go like this. 
they got to put two fingers down. So it's dual authentication. Um, and it's got to be a person's hand. It's got to be their eyes. So um, that's kind of hard to replicate. Mm -hmm. um, so physically getting to the server is very difficult. Getting to people's data in an SDN environment is actually quite easy. So we can provide all the physical security in the world, but it can't stop a cyber attack. Very helpful. Um, so I want to encourage our uh, attendees to please send in uh, questions on the Q&A function. Um, there's one that I think is very interesting that uh, has come in regarding the um, cultural transformation uh, that was uh, necessary uh, to, to take colonies brick and mortar E REIT model, and you haven't actually mentioned colony per se yet, so please explain colony, uh, into digital bridges, digital infrastructure models. So that, that's, a, that's a cultural and a digital transformation. How, how did that come about? How easy was it? Uh, what advice would you give to others who have to go through this process? So digital transformation is not easy. <laughs> Um, cause transforming the assets themselves was ended up John being the easy part. I think, um, the astute, uh, writer of that question, uh, lasered in on one thing, which is culture. So I started this firm in 2013, um, built it up to managing about 14 billion of assets in 2017. Um, ultimately found that we were, we were competing for assets and couldn't win cause we didn't have enough capital, you know, on demand and a fund structure. So. We went out and we raised our first fund, and we did that in a joint venture with a longtime real estate investor, uh, which happened to be a REIT called Colony Capital. Um, that fundraising from 17 to 19 went incredibly well. We exceeded it's the largest first time fund ever. We raised 4.1 billion. We invested it in 18 months. It was a smashing success. Returns are now well north of uh, over 20% for the fund. So it's been a great success. The board came to us and said, we really like this digital stuff. Um, we really don't like hotels and industrial parks and shopping centers and other disintermediated real estate. How do we go all digital and how do we get there and what's the fastest way to get there? So I said, well, the first thing is you got to do is you got to buy us. That's kind of the step one. And so we created a merger. We merged Digital Bridge and Colony together. Um, the enterprise from 2019 to March 1 of uh, 2021 was named Colony Capital. At that time, when, when we did the merger, we had 51 billion of real estate assets and we had 14 billion of digital assets. Um, the board gave me the, uh, the privilege and the, and the challenge of selling all the real estate and rotating into digital. So um, I was given two years, I, I'll, I'll never forget this, it was September of 2019. I was at the Bank of America reconference in New York City. And I was on stage with, at, at that point, our, our, our former founder and CEO, Tom Barrick, and he said, we will be 100% digital in two years. And I was like, I'm like, I don't think we rehearsed that, dude. Maybe we should talk about that off stage before you tell the entire world uh, that I'm going to sell $52 billion of real estate in 24 months. Um, what ended up happening was, uh, was a wild ride. Uh, it was two years of uh, a lot of hard work. Um, I got installed as the, uh, as the CEO um, about six months early. I got into the chair in July of uh, 2020. I was supposed to become CEO January 1, 2021. Um, and, and it started with changing the attitude and changing the people. It's the same cookbook that I've used for almost 30 years. And, you know, we had a scrappy, aggressive management team. Um, they had a management team that had been around for 20, 30 years. They were investing in real estate. They liked dividends. They didn't care about returns. And, you know, and they had a culture. They had a culture of, you know, 500 employees and 27 offices and $300 million a year in GNA. Well, my culture today is we're down to 186 employees. We've got seven offices and I've taken that GNA burn to 113 million. Sold the corporate plane, closed a lot of fancy offices. And um, you know, we're we come to work every day with our hard hats and we go to work. And so unfortunately we had to we had to say goodbye to a lot of people that weren't built for the digital economy. Um, we sold a lot of real estate and thankfully that real estate, the people went with that real estate. So whether we we sold hotels, industrial properties. We sold our, uh, our, our New York City office buildings to Scott Reckler, who's a friend of mine. Those people went with it. So as we sold assets, the people moved with the assets, which was good. And some people we had to, we had to part ways with, which is uncomfortable. But um, part of great leadership is discomfort. You've got to be prepared to be uncomfortable. Um, I just finished rotating 76 billion of assets in 24 months. 
um, massive cost cutting, taking net leverage from 14 times to six times. I had to make a series of really tough decisions. Uh, COVID hits, we run out of liquidity. I had to boost liquidity. And you just, you got to expect the unexpected. But look, if there's one piece of advice I can give to this entire uh, audience, it's students only. Um, making hard decisions is tough. We all delay making hard decisions because we want to do the right thing. When it's time to make a change, you make the change. Bad management is when you don't make changes quick enough. And in this economy, you move or you're dead and you gotta move quick. So don't capitulate. You know, good leadership is about, you know, gathering the data, having a really good plan, having great people around you and then building consensus around that plan. And once it's done, you go. There's only one person that can make the decision which is ultimately in our organization, it was me. But the amount of consensus that we built to arrive at the decisions that we made around restoring liquidity, reducing leverage, rotating the cash, selling old assets that didn't make sense for our mission, but ruthless efficiency and just making a list and saying, these are the things we're gonna do. Here's the timeline that we're gonna do them. We committed to those dates, John, we delivered. And most importantly, you know, I took over a company at a dollar share price and we've restored credibility and we were the best performing management team of the REIT sector last year. We went from probably being the worst rated management team by ISS Investor Services to being the number one rated management team in one year. And how do you do that? You do that by being decisive, by looking people in the eye and telling them what you're gonna do and ultimately um, delivering on those commitments. Um, Wall Street is very unforgiving when you don't deliver on commitments. And so as a young public company CEO, I've just been about creating clear uh, markers on the road that public investors can say, we're gonna go there, we're gonna go there, we're gonna go there. And then as we go there, we exceed it. And everything we did, we exceeded, including the rotation of the assets. So there's so many applied learnings to what I just went through the last two years. It was incredibly hard. Um, but once again, it just comes back to one thing, just having great people, having people what? sitting in skill positions that knew how to execute what I needed to get executed. I couldn't have done it without the, the, the great partners that work at, you know, that work at Digital Bridge today. And then finally, once we were rotated, we got to go back to DigiBridge. We changed the name, Colony, back to DigiBridge again. And uh, new branding, new logo, new attitude. Um, and the company's performing really well. Um, and we'll have another great quarter this year. Did you become a serial entrepreneur right out of Wharton? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Um, it's more fun. Uh, everyone has a favorite professor, right, John? I'm sure you have one. Niam, you can tell us your favorite professor story. I'll never forget the day I took management 231, a professor named Miles Bass. It's a quick story, John. He comes into the room. There's you know, 50 people in the room. It's sort of an advanced management class. He's really quiet, sort of soft-spoken guy, pretty short, bald, walks up. Huge letters. He puts J in the first blackboard. Yeah, we had blackboards then, sorry. Yeah. Then in the middle one, he puts O, blackboard. And then he puts B at the end. He goes, J-O-B. If you want a J-O-B, Professor Milton Friedman's down the hall and you can go take finance 263 and get a job at Wall Street. That's for the people that want jobs. You want to build a business, stay in this class. Literally like 10 people got up and left and they're like, yeah, I'm going to Jeremy Siegel's class right away. And they went to finance, you know, and I stayed and I stayed and I, I, um, I caught the bug. And um, I think it's, look, it's fun. It's adventurous, it's daring. Um, if you want to be your own person and you want to chart your own path, then entrepreneurship's for you. But it's not, it's not for everybody. You know, you have some dark moments. You have some, what I call the cliff moment in, in every entrepreneur's life where you got to sort of get out on the cliff and make the decision whether you're going to jump or not. And I've had these jump moments throughout my entire career. And merging with Colony was a huge jump moment. It was a busted REIT. And it was a, a business that was sort of on bad fortune. And I just saw the other side of the equation, which was I could fix it. And it was a tough tough decision. And, and when I made this decision, a lot of my friends called me and, you know, who run other REITs or run other big investment firms, like, what are you doing? You're nuts. And I said, no, you don't get it. This is one of the great opportunities. I'll have the chance to rotate 80 billion of assets and no one's ever done that in two years, ever. In the asset management space or the REIT space, we have a chance to do something great. And um, it's that opportunity to dare and, uh, you know, and to go for greatness is what keeps me excited and sitting here at, you know, Paris at 11.40 at night, getting ready for a full day of fundraising tomorrow. <laughs> and, and another question here uh, on undersea fiber networks. Um, mm -hmm. 
Does Digital Bridge have plans to challenge the dominance of tech firms market share of these networks? Well, we, we own some of those suboceanic routes today at Zao. Uh, Zao is, I think, the number three or number four largest owner of sub, submarine suboceanic cables. Um, the web scalers are continuing to build their own cables. Um, we are uh, doing some unique joint ventures with some of them. Believe it or not, they actually don't have unlimited CapEx. And everyone thinks like Google and Facebook have unlimited cap CapEx, Meta, but they don't, you know, and so there will be a, a finite point to where that CapEx runs out. Um, they'll have to monetize the assets they build. We'll be ready. We'll have a big balance sheet. Um, we've had these conversations with Amazon and Microsoft that they shouldn't build their own suboceanic fiber infrastructure. They want to do it. So, you know, that's fine. Um, we're, we're staying plenty busy with them and a bunch of other swim lanes. So uh, we'll keep building. Uh, it's not our favorite vertical, to be honest, John. Economics aren't that great. Returns aren't that great. You're, you're sort of unlevered day one, like one to three percent, which is hard. And you know you can get you know probably five and a half to seven times leverage on it and get your returns to six to seven percent. But if you don't lease out the other fiber strands, you know you don't get to the returns. And it's totally uncertain whether you can get the leasing that ultimately drives that decision. So it's a lot like building an office building, right? If you build an office building and it's a ten-story office building and you're only gonna lease two floors for the next 30 years, it's kind of a bad decision. Uh, someone else is asking about low earth orbit satellites. Leos. Um, to connect Leos. I'm uh, reading rural the question. areas. This is a good question. It's a great yeah. question. Are you investing in those? So it's interesting. We looked at the, there's there's two big providers out there. Everyone of course knows Elon Musk's company, Starlink. Um, you know, Starlink um, yesterday, just yesterday put 40 satellites into space, not four, 40, all right? He's put up 20,000 satellites very quietly in 24 months. And nobody talks about it. Elon Musk is blanketing the planet so that he can talk with your car. It's really interesting. I've become, um, one of my mentors, a guy named Charlie Ergen, who runs a company called Dish uh, in Denver. He's a great CEO. I mean, big culture guy, big dare to dream big guy. And he says, you know, his, his favorite business partner is Elon Musk. And so every time Dish puts up a new satellite, guess who he uses? He uses SpaceX. And he said, this guy thinks in dimensions that and the rest of the planet just doesn't think it. And he says, everything he touches works because he doesn't accept what's been taught to him. He doesn't accept what everyone's saying. So a simple problem, which was rocket propul propulsion. And for years, NASA said, look, the only way to get a spaceship down is got to put a parachute on it. You got to let it land in the ocean and you can't reuse rockets. Totally bad thinking. So he said, well, why don't I reverse the physics of how a rocket goes up into space? How do we use the reverse physics to figure out how we land a rocket so we can reuse it? NASA laughed at him. 14 years ago, they laughed at him and said, you can't do that. And we all know what SpaceX has done now. His rockets go up, he reuses the boosters, they land, 10 days, that bird goes right back up. It takes NASA 10 months, solving a problem. And he said, what I love about Elon is he said, look, everyone's looking at Leo's and saying, okay, it's gonna be, it's gonna destroy home internet, it's gonna destroy cellular communications, it's gonna destroy, he's gonna kill everybody. He said, everyone's missing the point. How many Teslas are on the planet today? Anyone know in the audience? Anyone wanna chat in? Let's see if I can see in the chat. Room. Anyone know how many Teslas are on the planet? Do, 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 let's see. Okay, well, I will tell you that there are roughly about um, 7 million Teslas today on the planet. Um, Elon thinks that he can get to over 200 million Teslas in this decade. And he looks at the car the way Tim Cook looked at the Apple phone over, you know, at the iPhone 15 years ago. So he believes the car will be the dominant communications device by mm -hmm. which he gathers information on consumers. So he believes that his car, and by the way, his um, network intelligence that are in those cars, Cadillac's now using it in their new SUV. And um, uh, Volkswagen uses NVIDIA today, but they're talking about switching over to uh, Elon's platform. He believes that his intelligence and vehicles will be the dominant um, computer processing capabilities in every car on the planet within 20 years. He wants to own every car. He's made it very clear. And if he has the car, he's got you. Because when you get in your car, you've got all your preferences. He knows where you're going to go shop. He knows where you're going to eat. He knows where you're going to work. He knows what you're listening to in the car. He, you know, 
he can predict a lot of behavior just by monitoring your car. So he views the car as the next iPhone. And Starlink is the methodology or the mechanism, the delivery mechanism by which he'll communicate with those subscribers. And he's going to get it for free. He's going to get a mobile network for free. And that's a very powerful, powerful thing. But he's just thinking in different dimensions, which is what I love. I love it when somebody takes, you know, takes a new opportunity and, mm. and slices and dices it. So there's a competitor called OneWeb. Um, it's now in its third owner in eight years. It's gone through two bankruptcies. Um, the folks that own it today are out of India. We looked at the most recent bankruptcy. We worked on it for about six months. And ultimately, again, just could not get comfortable with competing against the guy that thinks in multiple dimensions. It's not a guy you want to compete with. It's a guy you want to be a friend with. So instead, we're, we're laying fiber for Starlink. We're building um, what are called earth stations uh, for Starlink. We're building wireless ground communications. Because remember, Musk still has, he still has to have ground communications that interfaces with the satellite that triangulates off the car. He has to get access to mobile networks. So there's a big systems integration piece, John, that happens with Leo's. And uh, DigitalBridge, we're building a lot of that systems integration um, infrastructure to support Starlink on the ground and OneWeb. We're doing some work with OneWeb and um, Sirius XM Satellite Radio is a huge customer of ours. DISH is a massive customer of ours. So satellites are, are definitely somebody we work with and, and we'll continue to work with them. You come up against uh, China in terms of competing for assets or opportunities? You know, we, we, um, we, we've had some, some capital that we represent from China. Um, you know, it's uh, what I would tell you is that, um, you know, our bias is uh, we've had a hard time investing there. We owned a tower business there uh, about seven, eight years ago, which we sold uh, to a strategic in Indonesia. Um, it's hard to get money out of there, John. There's not a lot of transparency to that banking system. Transparency is such an important word. Uh, you can't get title to real estate. All the land's owned by the government. So any business you want to operate in China, guess who your partner is? The People's Republic of China. That's who your partner is. So um, we, we do invest uh, some money on behalf of the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Um, we've been doing that for six, seven years now. They've been great investors. They're totally silent. They have no governance. Uh, and now with CFIUS, they've, they've had all their governance stripped out. So we're basically on a blind pool basis representing some of their capital. But it's such a small part of our capital. And look, other PE firms have gone to China and they've taken that risk. Um, I got, I went there and we built a great business and ultimately when we went to go sell it. The exit multiple, which should have been 20 to 30 times ended up being 10 times. Why? China. So it's hard to make a return there when your exit multiple is compressed due to political uh, risk and, and currency risk and other you know, sort of factors of that nature. Let, let me toss it back to uh, Neam. Yes, so uh, I had uh, two questions, uh, both of them based on uh, what you discussed so far. Uh, let me, uh, basically, uh, one of them is a question, the other one is a comment. The question is, uh, uh, how do you balance uh, analytics, uh, uh, you know, data-driven decision-making with your own insight, uh, personal experiences, or basically your gut feeling when it comes to making a decision how how do you balance those two sources of uh information so <clears throat> it, that's fun uh, for me that's the fun part so we have our investment committee uh once a week Neam, where we uh we have a six person investment committee where i've i brought diversity across the firm to sit on that committee and we hear new ideas we hear final presentations um and ultimately you you have that final meeting Neam, which is go or no go final ic and it's a six member committee. I'm always the last to talk. I let the room go first. I work around the room. I gather consensus. You know, certainly we're looking at the modeling. We're looking at the diligence. We're looking at the quality of the assets. We're looking at where the asset is located. And then by that point in time, we've already spent a lot of time with the management team. So we know who they are. We know their personality traits. We know their credit score. We know what gives. And ultimately, you have to make a bet on humans. I know that sounds so inherently basic, but you know when you do get to final investment committee and the returns are right and the assets correct and the business plan is good and you've done all the analytics and you've spent three months and you've spent three, four, five million dollars, you ultimately have to come down and look across the table and say, that is someone I'm about to put multiples of billions of dollars into. Do I trust them? 
Do they have good character? Do they work hard? Um, do their employees like them? Um, does their family like them? I mean, there's so many factors that go into the quality of the human being. And um, I bet the athlete at the end, the math can pencil out and it can all be good returns and good diligence. But if you're not comfortable with your partner and you're not comfortable with their vicissitude and their gumption to want to wake up and fight every day, I know if somebody's a fighter or not. It's really simple. And executives that come across my desk that don't know how to fight and can't swim, I don't invest in them. How now do you that, know that? That's the, how that's do you know sort if somebody the, is a fighter? Well, you, you, you do a lot of work. Um, you interview them. You ask them tough questions about, you know, talking about their toughest moment as a child, talking about their toughest failure, um, finding out if they compete, if they know how to compete. Um, have they ever, you know, competed at an elite level? Do they understand what it takes to win? Um, you ask them what they do on the weekends. Um, you ask them to reconstruct, you know, their, their family life. You ask them to reconstruct their childhood. There's a million techniques that I use to get into somebody's head to figure out, are you a winner or are you someone that sits on the bench? Sorry, Fabulous. it's a bit tough, but you've got to ultimately, you know, find the inner workings of someone's desire to want to fight and figure out if they're up for the fight. Cause not everyone Nam, is up for the fight. I understand. Well, that certainly works for your case because last week when I was researching uh, Digital Bridge uh, to prepare for this meeting, I was looking at your uh, stock performance and uh, you uh, you did not mention it, but uh, let me mention that you've been outperforming uh, S&P 500 and NASDAQ, not, not only them, but Bitcoin and Ethereum over the last year since you took, uh, took, uh, took the position. Uh, by a wide margin. And that was before the crypto crash of two days ago. So uh, you've, been, you've been doing fantastic work there. Well, uh, I didn't know that, by the way, <laughs> but thank you for saying that. I think, um, look, I think uh, when you become a public company CEO, you stop looking at your share price. Um, what I've come to figure out pretty quickly is if you consistently, Neem, beat your numbers, and you consistently put out clear guidance and your messaging is clear about how you're going to grow and most importantly, how you differentiate yourself against your peer set. And then you can back it up with data on how you're kicking the shit out of your peers. That's how your stock price moves. Exactly. Ooh, sorry, for, sorry for cursing, but um, I'm a competitive human being. I want to win. I want to win the right way. Um, I want to win with um, a high degree of efficacy um, and I want to win you know, with the right people. Um, but creating the right business plan, creating the right mission and being really good at communicating is so important. You want to outperform. You want your stock to work. You want your stock to perform. Um, you just got to work a little harder and you got to, you got to beat your peers. You got to wake up every day and you got to want to win. Last year on a global basis, we did 198 megawatts of leasing. We're a small REIT. We're a fraction of digital realty and Equinix. Mm -hmm. Neither of those organizations did over 125 megawatts of leasing. The two largest data center REITs in the world, we almost doubled their production. And we're the small scrappy private guy. Why? We just wake up and we want to win. We want to punch a little harder, we want to move a little faster. That ultimately is what, 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 what shareholders want to hear. Right. They want to hear that you're going to go out and you're going to work harder and you're going to win the hustle points. So let, let me ask you a question uh, uh, related to your earlier answer. What, what does Mark do on weekends? Um, all right. So I'm a bit of a creature of habit. <laughs> um, so Saturdays are uh, typically up at six, um, doing some sort of physical activity, whether it's yoga or gym. Uh, I have my first call usually at 730. We've got 26 CEOs globally. Um, I try to touch all 26 CEOs about every two weeks. So I use Saturday mornings in half hour increments where I have what I call coffees where, you know, we, we just zoom together and we're talking about, Hey, what's going on with leasing? What's going on with your people? You know, tell me what's keeping you up at night. Just very casual fireside chats with all of our CEOs, giving them quick guidance and, and what I think is important and what, what they need to be focused on and keeping that human interaction with the, the people that run our 26 companies globally is really important and they, they want that. They want that connectivity. And so I, I spend most of my Saturdays doing that. Um, then typically I, I do want to get outside. I like Florida. Um, I like to golf. Um, I like to ride horses and play polo. 
uh, physical outdoor activity is, is really important. Um, some people that know me know that I, I like to cook. I really enjoy staying home and cooking. I guess the pandemic taught me to, to, to really reignite with my Italian heritage and cooking. So I enjoy that quite a bit. <laughs> and um, Sundays, it's a bit of a repeat, but more internal meetings with the team. Um, just getting people ready for, you know, uh, doing postmortems on investment committee, figuring out where deals are, checking in with our top deal guys, um, and then checking in on Sundays. I check in with some of our Middle East businesses and, and investors. So it's kind of half days on Saturdays and Sundays, but it's a it's a seven day a week job. Um, okay. You want to win. You want to run a big company. You want to be a public CEO. You got to work seven days a week. There's no off switch, but you got to find balance, too. Um, one thing COVID really taught me was my health. And so I've been committing, you know, blocking time. And, and by the way, you've got to block time. You got to like go into Outlook and say, this is locked off. You cannot book anything here. And you got to make time for yourself. Um, you know, it sounds a little selfish, but maintaining yourself and, and, and keeping the energy level up, energy begets energy. So um, I'm a big believer and you got to, you got to, you know, uh, find something that you like and, and do it and Make sure you can turn your phone off. So I think oh, another uh, thing is I never bring my phone to bed. Right. I leave my phone locked in my office. Never bring your phone to bed. Yeah. Um, millions of Americans can't sleep because they put their phones next to the bed. Don't do it. Get a regular alarm clock and put your phone somewhere else. And you'll be a much happier human being. The digital Very. guy telling everyone to de-digitize when you go to bed. Very good advice. Very good advice. And uh, I don't I don't think I've ever heard before someone say um, when you become the CEO of a public company, that's the time to forget about looking at the share price. Yeah, you, get, you can't. I, th I thought that that was a most profound comment. And, um, you know, it's fascinating. It's, it's, it's interesting, John. I like I spent the first year looking at the share price and I, I would drive myself crazy. And 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 finally, I just figured out, like, look, this isn't hard right? Do the right thing. Yeah. Work hard. Beat your guidance. Set clear, you know, deliverables. Grow. You've got to have organic growth. If you don't have organic growth, your stock story is never going to work. Neem, to your point, we've been putting up like 30% organic growth now for like seven, eight direct quarters. When we moved to a digital business, um, when was it? In, in 2019, mm -hmm. the digital business has had quarter over quarter se sequential EBITDA growth of like 25%. That's crazy. Right. to put up 10 quarters of that kind of growth. Now that's starting to slow a little bit. We'll probably have like low twenties this year. And maybe we get into the high teens a couple years down the road, but we keep growing and we're able to communicate that message super clear. So strong communication, strong growth, um, focus, and just don't worry about it. Like do the right thing, execute your business plan, share price will follow. And it takes a lot of work. You got, you got to spend a lot of time with public shareholders. Tell them the story. Don't, right. don't push them away, bring them in. We had an activist, like the day I became the CEO, I had an activist shareholder immediately in my shareholder base. This guy Blackwells, he's attacking Peloton today. Um, and he was texting me earlier. He's like, ah, I'm taking down Peloton today. All right, that's fine, dude, whatever floats your boat. But like I inherited that day one and I had to deal with an activist. And someone said, how do you deal with an activist? Because you, you figured out, you figured that out. And I said, it's really simple. Um, I ignored him. I told the street very clearly what I was going to do to transform the company. I was the CEO. He was attacking me on the first day. And I just said, not having it. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to out execute this guy and everything that he puts in prints a lie and we're going to outperform him. And eventually he'll come to me. And, you know, nine months later, he came to me and on his knees and we, we struck a good deal with him. And I could have heard him in that transaction, but I didn't. Instead, we, we created a partnership. I went out and bought some shares. He gave me all his shares in a trust and I controlled all his shares. And I didn't pay any of his costs. I think I paid him like a quarter million dollars of his, of his lawyer's fees because we were going back and forth with letters. And I said, look, I'm not going to pay for your activist campaign, but here's what I am going to do. You're going to give me all your shares. I'm going to vote your shares. I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy shares and we're going to put in a pool together. And we're going to partner. And above a certain share price, I'm going to give you a percentage of the profits. He was like, what? I'm like, yeah. So if we're successful together, you win. So turn, turn something that's adversity and turn it into a positive situation where you get somebody on sides with you. Everything in life is about getting people in the boat, rowing in the same direction with you. And that's, that's how you beat an activist. You beat an activist by sweating them out. And once you've sweated them out, make them your partner. 
Excellent uh, advice as we're approaching the top of the hour. It's uh, time for you to take a good sleep in Paris and don't forget to <laughs> yeah, uh, lock be up the in the drawer. Um, thank you so much, Mark, uh, for introducing us to uh, the detail of uh, the REIT game in digital infrastructure and for uh, many words of wisdom uh, uh, about how to be an effective entrepreneur and CEO as well. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, John. Blanca, thank you, entire UM and graduating class. Good luck, class of 2022. And, uh, you know, look forward to hearing about great success stories of uh, this class and many others, John. All right. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Bye. for joining us. And uh, a very good evening from Miami.